Welcome to the Mystic Fool's Journey Podcast. I'm Anna, and this is Ruth. Howdy! And this is an occult history podcast. And today we're diving into Ouija boards. Or is it Ouija boards? I don't know. Only time will tell. <laughs> Only time will tell. And probably not in this podcast because I don't think we actually know. <laughs> Maybe so. we should consult the Ouija board to see how oh. it'd like to be, you know, claimed. That's true. Have you ever played with a Ouija board? I think I did once. I really? I, I think, and it wasn't that, yeah, I did once at like a sleepover. And it was around the time, weirdly, I hadn't seen the movie, what is it? Um, pra not Practical Magic. Oh, the best movie. What's the other one? The one where they do light as a feather, stiff as a board. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so uh, we did, like, we tried doing that. And it's one of those things, like, I hadn't seen any of those movies yet. I was pretty young. It was, like, elementary school, but, like, they did have a Ouija board. I could not tell you if it actually spelled anything out. Because I think, like, I was just like, what is this thing? What are we doing? <laughs> yeah, right? So I have not had any particular wild experiences with Ouija boards. Knowing what you know now, would you ever do it as an adult? Um, I mean, yeah, I think this is once again, like, you know, when you like know too many things intellectually, so it probably yeah. gets in the way of having like the fun of it. Right. I would probably be like, sure, let's try it. But I'm not gonna like do it alone. I'm gonna need to be with someone who like you can't. That's a rule. You can't do it alone. Oh, good. I didn't know it had rules. So there are wow. rules. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, good. I would really need to be with someone who's jazzed to do it and like wants to know something. Because okay. I would just be along for the ride. Like, I'd just be extra hands. I'd just be like, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. I'm here to help. I don't know what you, I don't know what you want. <laughs> I'm here to, like, try weird shit. Like, just at least try something once, right? What about you? Yeah. Have you ever used a Ouija board? No, I've never used a Ouija board. Um, I was terrified of demons as a child. Oh, uh, oh yes. Yes. And mm. all of that sort of thing. I had trouble sleeping at night because of it and all that sort oh. of thing. So the idea of using a Ouija board was, like, peak you know satanistic ter terrible yeah. thing to do and so even if i would have had the opportunity which i never did because i was a christian kid that only interacted with other christian kids oh yeah i would have never. never done that yeah, yeah. it's like oh no we're all going to hell yeah for sure but um as an adult i i don't know if i would right like i feel like what like once again like if you and i got in a room and we like would need a third person that like wants to do it i know or yeah. like feels excited because i'm like i don't know man i don't need to like ask anybody anything yeah like, for sure what's up grandma you good exactly. like, <laughs> like i'm not i'm not like dying to know something from like an ancestor or, like right I, I guess you could just leave it open and be like tell me a message if i did do it i'd go hard I'd go yeah. like yeah. We'd go to like an abandoned haunted place. Oh, you got to do that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I did go to an abandoned penitentiary once, which was fun. What? Why? Yeah. Uh, you know, you're in college and you, you want to sneak into a place and really, uh, wow. yeah, it was just spooky. And I had to ride in someone's like trunk because like they didn't have enough seats. <laughs> that's classic. That's, so that's like a rite cool. of passage into jump adulthood. The fence. Yeah, like ride in a trunk, jump the fence, walk through an abandoned penitentiary. It was really hoping I'd see some stuff. I never had to do that sort of thing because I was too tall for it all. But being a smaller person, I imagine you would always get yeah. handed the shorthand stick of I do. seating I, arrangements. I, I, I always the middle seat, always the weird back trunk seat, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's my lot in life. <laughs> I've accepted it. <laughs> so I in preparation for this episode I tried to watch the movie Ouija yeah how and it go? was so bad basically do you know anything about the plot of the movie mm -mm, not at all I assume okay. someone has to murder someone it sounds spooky yeah so the plot of the movie is you know pretty bad so basically like as kids they played this Ouija board and then these two girls grow up and like, then one of the other girls has to clean out her attic and she finds the Ouija board. So she plays the Ouija board all alone, which is like class number one rule, never play alone. And then also I think number two rule is like, you have to say goodbye each time you play it. And oh, she didn't say I goodbye. I heard, I have heard that where it's just kind of like, it, you have to cut off communication or like, I don't know, leaves the channel open essentially. Exactly. That kind of the vibe. Okay. Yeah. So before she's, she doesn't say goodbye, but she burns it to like get rid of it and yeah. then uh, the same night something you know is haunting her house and it gets inside of her and it's haunting her and then she uh trigger warning 
she jumps off of her uh, second story landing with some fairy lights tied around her neck and she dies. And then her friends have to like, they're all sad. And then yeah. her friends <laughs> get asked by her parents to like house sit the house. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like one several months after... after the murder. Mm. And so they do, and they start playing with the Ouija board to reconnect with Debbie, their friends. Oh, no. Yeah. Here but it then is. they find out that it's not Debbie talking to them. It's of something not. else. It's the so same they, thing. Yeah. Yep. So they go to the old town crone in the uh, senior citizen's assistant living home, and they're like, what's up? And she's like, it's my crazy mom who was <laughs> haunting the house. And oh. what you have to do is like find the spirit, find the body in the in the attic. And apparently there's just like been a dead body in the attic the whole time. Oh, they would have found that. That thing stanks. I know. And so even grosser, uh, th- she's like, you have to undo the stitches that are sewn on her mouth to so she can speak. And so they go up and they do it, and then everybody's saved. I don't know. I didn't really keep that track. was it. Oh, okay. yeah. So that was it. She was just like, I just need to be able to speak my truth. And all right. Yeah, 10 out of 10, don't recommend. Okay, unfortunate. I, I do like a good spooky movie, so sad sad to hear that that's off the list. But um, It's true. Apparently the sequel is better, but I'm not giving oh, it a chance. There's a sequel. <laughs> it was bad, and it's still got a sequel. Okay, great. We love Hollywood. <laughs> we love it. So anyways, that kind of uh, helped spur this deep dive into the history of the Ouija board, which is actually pretty fun, so let's dive on in. Yeah. So back in the day, like way back in like February 1891, newspapers started buzzing with ads about this thing called the Ouija board. It technically wasn't like a Ouija called a Ouija board yet, but it was, you know, the whole shtick of it. A toy shop in Pittsburgh went all out, originally calling it the Wonderful Talking Board. <laughs> that just sounds cute. That's just I like, know, oh, right? Adorable. So they, could, they claimed that it could like spill the beans on the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. And get this, it promised never failing amusement and recreation for all classes. All that for just a dollar fifty. Wow. That's $1. a crime 50. how much board games cost now. <laughs> I know, right? I mean a like dollar. I'm spending like forty bucks a pop these days. One dollar. Jeez Oof. Louise. So it was the ultimate link between what you know and what you don't. And another p- paper called it interesting and mysterious swearing that it was proven at the patent office before it was allowed. We'll get into that later. Oh, yes, yeah, That's say, a whole story proven... of, in itself. How do you... Pr- okay, yeah. Yeah, How do you we'll, prove it? we'll power through and we'll get to the proving part. It's really funny. So imagine the Ouija board you're picturing today. That's like basically what it was back then. It really hasn't changed. A flat, le- flat board with letters, numbers, yes and no, and a goodbye tucked in the quarters. Plus, there's like this funky tear-shaped thing called a planchette that moves around the board. Back in the day, it was wood, but it's all plastic now, unfortunately. Boo. I know, truly. Uh, Before the Ouija board took the spotlight, various other talking boards and devices were used in the context of spiritualism and divination. But here's a few examples, because they're kind of fun. Yeah. So planchette writing, before the planchette Ouija board or before the Ouija board, planchette devices were popular. So it's like the heart-shaped thing, but it had wheels and a pencil on it. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you and your buddies would put your hands on it, and bam, it starts moving and scribbling out messages. That's more interesting to me than the board. Yeah, it's the OG Ouija board. I will officially try this now. (laughs) I mean, not alone, but like that one, I would do that one. (laughs) Yeah, for sure, I would too. So uh, that'd be a cool like tarot card deck. Oh, that would be fun. Ooh. Product idea? Product yeah. Idea. Nobody Product. steal that. Nobody steal that. Okay, so then there's table turning. And so, like, you get a group of your pals, and you all put your hands on a table, and whoop, it starts wiggling and tipping. And it was like the table had a mind of its own, answering questions and giving everyone the creeps. So, classic spiritualist hangout move. Uh, so... I'm just talking out loud. The table turning thing, because there's nothing written on the table. It's just like, oh, if you clatter three times, it's a yes. Like I that... think like there are certain moves where like the okay. group agrees right side is yes, left side is oh, no, that okay. sort of thing. Gotcha. But once you get, you know, I just feel like that's uh, one teenage boy thrown into the mix and it all goes to <laughs> hell in a handbasket. Oh, oh man. Yeah, there's. 
nothing no any teenagers at that point you're just like yeah we're gonna make this shit clatter (laughs) right and then the back in the day the last one is alphabet dice some folks rolled alphabet dice to get messages from the great beyond like you roll interpret the letters and voila spirit messages it's like yahtzee with ghosts (laughs) honestly i feel like the ghosts would appreciate that they need to like help them pass the time yeah we gotta have some some ghost enrichment activities going on yeah So these precursor devices varied in design and mechanics, but they all shared the common theme of attempting to facilitate communication with the spirit realm. The Ouija board, patented in 1891, gained immense popularity and became an iconic representation of this practice. But its predecessors paved the way for the concept of using a board to communicate with unseen forces. And sure, they might have been a bit over-enthusiastic in their ads. (laughs) Interest. I'll have to look them up. Being in marketing, I have to. I know yeah. our our skills in advertising. We could never relate. <laughs> <laughs> but turns out the Ouija board was kind of intriguing. So the story goes like this: the Ouija board wasn't just like born out of nowhere. It hitched a ride on the spiritualism train that was chugging through the U.S. in the 1800s. Choo <laughs> choo. We love that one. <laughs> Spiritualism was all about chatting with the dead, and it was a huge deal, especially from, uh, especially after the Fox sisters from upstate New York claimed that they were getting messages from spirits who knocked on walls. Oh. I know. Maybe we should deep dive into them someday. Yeah, probably. I think I read a little bit about them, because I think they actually, like, performed, like, or something like that, or it's just kind of like they would let people, like, watch, right? Yeah, they were, like, um... They, like, did, uh, you know, seances to the public, buy tickets, that sort of thing. And they had yeah. all sorts of, like, uh, uh-huh. tricks up their sleeve. Yeah, it wasn't just, like, one-on-ones, like, oh, be the only person in this room. They actually, like, made it a show. Yeah. So two things I want to talk about eventually. Um, yeah. There's a town in upstate New York that is all about spiritualism to this day. Like, everybody in the town is, like, a spirit medium. And they have, like, a festival each year. And, like... Their whole economy is based around spiritualism. We should go. When is the when is this festival, Ruth? We I should know. Go. Seriously, I've looked into it. We should definitely go. We could stay yeah. with Alex's grandparents or something. Hell yeah, let's do it. And then number two, uh, I want to deep dive into Houdini, who like he had this whole shtick of debunking seances. Yeah, I did. really love that. There's some crazy cool stories in that in that whole thing. Should we should add that to the list? We'll add it to the list. <laughs> so, anyways, seances caught on like wildfire, and soon spiritualism was the cool thing to do, even for the folks in the White House. Even Mary Todd Lincoln held seances in the White House after her son kicked the bucket in 1862. I did not know that. I think we mentioned that. Was it? Was it Reagan's wife? That Nancy had an Reagan. Nancy Reagan had an astrologer on staff. I forgot about that. Yeah, but I didn't. I didn't know. I mean, it shouldn't surprise me. It these people are just people of the times. Like, yeah, of course, there's going to be like political leaders with like spiritualism and seances are are a common thing that are going to like participate in them. Yeah, I think that's the book I'm going to write one day. Yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah, white the White House in American early American history in relation to like spiritualism and Do like it. the woo woo. I think yes. that'd be so cool. I think you should. I mean, maybe this podcast is just like a little testing ground. Hey, write there in we if go. you're interested. Good. Yeah, write would you tarot- buy my book? Would you buy Ruth's book <laughs> about how American politics has potentially been influenced by spiritualism? I Right? It'd be so fun. Honestly, it could spark a whole series. I mean, France. I think so. I mean, truly. Yeah. I mean, oh, my God. Well. <laughs> so, anyways... There's this guy we're going to start talking about now called Charles Kennard. And he exact wasn't exactly like a business tycoon extraordinaire. He was always on the lookout for opportunities to make a quick buck. But let's just say that luck wasn't on his side. <laughs> oh, yikes. Yeah, hailing from a family of prosperous Delaware merchants, Kennard tried his luck on the Maryland's eastern shore in the late 1880s. What was he up to, you ask? Let me tell ya. Please. He fancied himself a fertilizer expert. Oh, that's yeah. not what I was expecting. <laughs> yep, he cooked up some super secret bone mix recipes. Uh. But honestly, who in the fertilizer biz didn't claim to have some mystical formula? 
I'm uh, I'm really excited to see how this connects to Ouija board. <laughs> I mean, please know, tell right? me, please tell me this man was like, help me with my fertilizer business, and then like <laughs> it worked or something, and he's like, cool, now I'll market this. <laughs> right, I know. So things seemed promising at first, but life just took a nosedive. This Chestertown plant, where all the fertilizer magic happened, hit a rough patch. Blame it on a combo of drought, tough competition. And him just like drowning in debt. Yeah. Oh. Auction yeah. time it was. <laughs> oh. Now don't despair because in strolls E.C. Reich, a Prussian immigrant with an office right next to Kennard's in a four story wooden hotel in Chestertown's itty bitty business hub. Oh, okay. Mm hmm. So Reich similarly was no stranger to odd career shifts. <laughs> He went from furniture making to crafting coffins and then okay. took a detour into the Undertaker gig. Oh, yeah. He just skipped straight back into like, let me put the people in the coffins. <laughs> exactly. So it's just like a classic 1800s yeah. job transition, right? I wish it was that easy now. But I know. Man, is, they make it seem so simple. They're like, listen, I can work, work with wood so I can work with coffins now. So you're like, oh, okay. I know. Exactly. It truly, I mean... They didn't need any certifications to, like, try no, to do a no job resume. Yeah. Like, imagine trying to explain. It's like, yeah, like, I'm sorry, ma'am. You spent three years making coffins and you want to run my marketing business now? I'm like, yeah, I marketed my coffins, right? <laughs> exactly. <Makes sense. laughs> uh, a simpler time. So here's where things get interesting. Reich wasn't just your run-of-the-mill undertaker. He was also a bit of a tinkerer, always messing around with stuff. And Kennard, well, he had a fresh plan up his sleeve. This really sounds like the start to like some like wacky TV show where these <laughs> two guys who can never quite make business work like stumble into success. It's truly, I know, a comedy of errors. Yes. So picture this back in 1886, while Kennard and Reich were practically office buddies, the newspapers were buzzing about this wild talking board trend hitting up in Ohio. It even made its way to the local news, thanks to the Associated Press story featured in the Kent County News. So Kennard and Reich, probably totally hyped up by the AP scoop, decided to join forces. Yep, they rolled up their sleeves and cranked out a solid dozen of their very own talking boards. Oh. So the former coffin maker turned undertaker, Reich started whipping these boards up on the down low. Prototypes, if you will. And that's the birth of the Ouija board right there. There wasn't like, did they just straight up copy it? Like, I guess at this point, it doesn't like matter. It's just whoever could like market it better because there weren't like trade. I not that there weren't trademarks, but it, it feels like this there was wasn't a time. one yet. Yeah, that was like yeah, this was very much like a time when it was very easy to be like, well, if I just market the same thing better, it no one's gonna like argue yeah. with you. <laughs> exactly, it's oh exactly God. what was going on. So fast forward to 1890, Kennard starts hustling his so-called talking board invention to potential big shots, and the Ouija journey is just getting started from here. After facing rejection after rejection, along comes Elijah Bond, your friendly neighborhood attorney. Oh. The interesting twist? He swears up and down that his sister-in-law is some kind of medium superstar. Okay, okay, I see where this is going. Yeah, so finally someone took the bait. And just like that, the Canard Novelty Company, officially born the day after Halloween, a whopping 125 years ago, starts cranking out Ouija boards. And they pretty much look the same as the ones we have today. So talk about a blast from the past. Nothing has changed. That's, I mean, that's longevity for you. <laughs> you, make, yeah, you make it one solid product and you're good to go. That's for sure. I, wow, you know, I feel like I would have, I don't know, how would you spice it up? You know how, like, they change classic board games every now and then? Right. Like, would would you add anything, Ruth, to the Ouija board? Like, or would you have a different take on it? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, should is there we something reinvent that would, like, the Ouija board? Is there something that you're like, wow, like, does it take too long? Should there just be words? Is there... Yeah, here's what I'll say. Yeah. I think that we're limiting ourselves here. There is beauty in the simplicity of just the board with the plan check. But I think we are limiting ourselves here in like the ergonomics of it all. I feel like oh. we kind of beef up the board itself a bit and maybe add in like uh, some more ways for, you know, the 
the the the weight of everybody's hands to kind of you know oh interest so we need to yeah. like work on the planchette somehow like it yeah. is kind of small i feel like if you have too many people on that planchette like i felt like i was gonna like accidentally fall onto the board at one point because i was just like oh we it was like a big sleepover the one time we did this so okay picture those, really this cool yeah twister but a ouija board okay 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 i'm here yeah mm-hmm. that's the idea boom <laughs> boom a <laughs> twister size ouija board how does it work i don't know maybe we'll market it and you'll get to use it someday <laughs> exactly do you have any good ideas for reinventing the ouija board I don't know. Like, for me, I, I get that, like, I'm a little impatient, which is why the whole, like, planchette with the pencil or the graphite attached, so that way you could just, like, get the words immediately. in mm-hmm. Right? Because, like, also, to be honest, I couldn't keep up with the letters that were coming out. Like, right. unless there was somebody off, like, writing, writing it down. them down, I was like, I'm not going to remember this. Like, I can't keep, especially if it's a sentence. Mm-hmm. So, like, a little bit of my impatience versus, you know, I was just trying to figure out, like, is there a way to do whole words at a time? But that's why I liked the pencil when you mentioned that. I was like, that seems like the fastest route. Yeah. Okay. So, you know how, like, when you're typing words on your phone and it, like, auto... auto Yeah. Mm. There's, like, the options, the three options. Maybe that in, like, Ouija board form. That would be interesting. So, basically, a digital version. Yep. AI power. Yeah. (laughs) Is it... Oh, that's another question for another day. But, like, can AI be influenced by spirits? I mean, I feel like that's our market right there. (laughs) You know? That's the market. We got to figure out how to harness AI to, like, connect to the spirit realm. Right. That's the next step. Let's keep that in the back of our heads. Let's not talk too much about it publicly. Uh, Yeah, right. Sorry. Sorry, listeners. We'll come out with it someday, maybe. (laughs) Yeah. So here's the kicker. They didn't have a name for the Ouija board yet. According to the story, Bond's sister-in-law, Helen Peters, who was, again, apparently a strong medium, threw out the name during a session. They asked the board, and it said Ouija, claiming it meant good luck. It's pretty kind of kind of spooky, right? Interesting. But apparently, there's a lot of, like, uh, different theories on this. Like, some people say that, like, Ouija is, like, a combination oh, of French yeah. and German words for yes. We oh yeah, and we Shaw. and yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, I think the truth of it is that Peters had a locket with a na- lady named Weeda inside, and that Ouija is probably just like a play on that word. Like I guess yeah, because like if she if they had had any kind of conversations and like she kind of like secretly knew that 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 name was in there, she might like throw out just like a little off version of it so it. Doesn't seem like she was like, oh, well, I just copied your locket name. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And here's the cherry on top. When they applied for a patent, they had to prove that the board actually worked. Here it is. Yep. So they took it to the patent office and summoned some spirits and had the planchette spell out the name of the chief patent officer. So white faced and all, the officer gave them the green light. And on February 10th, 1891, they scored a patent for their new toy or game. And that, my friends, is how the Ouija board came to be. That's really interesting. Did Do we know if they, like, knew his name ahead of time? Or was it supposedly... Oh, absolutely. Like... Oh, okay. <laughs> but I mean, he that's was just, had like, to have been what happened. I mean, I, clearly, if we have some listeners who are believers, then they probably don't believe that they might. You yeah. Know. There's two sides to this. It could be, uh, oh, they didn't know his name and they got it right and the spirits are real. Or they knew his name and the officer, like, just, I don't know, didn't <laughs> yeah, didn't take it into account. Like, I get that, like, they didn't have the internet back then, so it wasn't as easy to Google. So it'd be more freaky if someone walked up to you and was like, hey, Ruth. And you're like, I don't <laughs> know you. <laughs> I do- yeah. How did you know my name? But at the same time, back then, it's not like you're Googling to make your appointment. You have to, like, go into the offices yeah, anyway. So, yeah, like, you have to taking a people. quick swipe or asking around on whose name is what. Like, uh-huh. like who am I meeting with to the secretary? And they're like, oh, and you're like, how do I spell it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. The world may never know the true answer. But they proved it, and they have a patent. Yep. Mm. So, like, the first patent for the Ouija board back in the day, it was a bit sketchy. So it didn't bother explaining how the thing worked. It just said that it did. Oh, no. (laughs) And this was all part of their master plan. 
The less the Kennard Company spilled about the board's inner workings, the more mysterious it seemed. Robert Murch, the official Ouija historian. Historian? Yeah, he's a Ouija historian. So I feel like we all, we keep coming across these jobs that are like dream jobs. And you're like, how did you get the what, do you, what else do you have to do? Like, it it sounds like the Ouija board was invented not that long ago. Like, it, you're... Your job ends in 20 years. Like, it's just kind of I know. Dust. I feel like after this podcast episode, you and I could both claim to be Ouija historians. Yeah. Anyways, he calls these guys very shrewd businessmen. For them, it was all about the moolah. They didn't care why people thought it worked. They just wanted them to buy it. And oh boy, did it work. By 1892, the Kennard Novelty Company went from one factory to a whopping seven in Baltimore, New York, Chicago, and even London. That's just a Ouija board. They didn't make anything else. I know. So fast forward to 1893, and Kennard and Bond were out, passing the torch to this guy, William Fold. The Ouija board was hitting the jackpot. It became this crazy success, tapping into the weird side of American culture, marketed as both a a mystical oracle and family fun. (laughs) I don't know about family fun. I would love to find out more about the family fun side of this. Right? (laughs) I know. I want to hear from people who just had good, wholesome fun with their kids on the Ouija board. Because all the stories are not that. I know, seriously. So it wasn't just spiritualists buying this thing. People from all walks of life jumped on the Ouija board bandwagon. Because as Merch put it, people want to believe. That's so true. Very X-Files. I want to believe. It's true. So you won't believe the shady stuff that went down in the Ouija board's early days. Money talks, right? By the early 1890s, these boards were flying off the shelves at a rate of 2,000 a week. That's no small potatoes back then. That's a lot. 2,000 a week? I know. But, and then when you think about it, like, that was only, like, $3,000 back then. Well, I mean, like, I guess I'm not a calculator, but if you account for inflation, you know, it might seem more substantial now. (laughs) But still. I wonder. I wonder how much that is in inflation. Huh. I, I mean, part of me is like, hmm, all right, hold up. Inflation yeah, calculator? Wait, let's put bets. I think it's probably $30,000. 30, uh, I think it's, so it was a dollar fifty per board. So you said 3000 a week? 2000 a week. 2000 Oh, a week? yeah, they were making $3,000 a week. 100000 100, Yeah, I mean, considering they had several factories... 101000 Wow, that's a lot of money. Yeah, so they're making like $100,000 a week. That's Dude, crazy. Mm, invest some of that. I probably would have retired after like one year of those sales. Two yeah, years, maybe. for sure. That's for sure. $100,000 a week, man. No small potatoes. No small potatoes. So William Fold, the guy who worked for and invested in the Canard Novelty Company, eventually took the reins of the Ouija business after the founders called it quits a bit too soon. Then, Uh yeah, it's crazy. So then they then went on to make millions and millions of dollars. But before raking in all of that cash, William's brother Isaac, who was also a partial owner in the company, had gotten the boot from the company and things got messy real quick. I'm talking like lawsuits galore between the brothers. The bitterness ran so deep that Isaac went as far as digging up his baby daughter's remains and moving her to another spot outside of, like, the family plot. Whoa. Isn't that pretty cool? People are wacky. Like, really? I know. All right. I now know what I want to ask the Ouija board. I want to talk to these dudes. (laughs) I know. I want to talk to these dudes and be like, come on, man. Really? You did what? I know. Seriously. Uh, so now let's fast forward to a tragic twist, an even tragicer twist. Oh. William Fold, the big cheese of the Ouija, met his end in a fatal accident at his Harford Avenue factory. He claimed in a 1919 Baltimore Sun story that the Ouija itself told him to build the factory there. Oh. Which is kind of spooky. But while, yeah, while overseeing the installation of a flag, the iron railing broke and sent him plummeting off the roof. And to top it off, the coroner's report reads like a crime novel. A broken rib pierced his heart. Oh. Talk about going out with a bang. 
Ouch. Oh my God. And then on his deathbed, he made his kids swear an oath to never sell the Ouija outside the family. Mm. Family drama at its finest. Interesting. This does feel like a really good start to like a family curse story. There is. There was a lot of stuff that goes along in their family about the Ouija board that we could have gone into. It's pretty interesting. Um, But the funny part is they all were Protestants. Yep. <laughs> so so they didn't really like listen to any of the, the Bible verses where they're like, sorcery's bad. Don't talk know. to spirits because, you know, they were making a lot of money. They're like, they but were- I... I'm making enough money to that like talking to spirits seems like a good idea. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and so then when times got tough, the Ouija board still shined. The 1910s and 20s with World War One and the Jazz Age saw a surge in Ouija's popularity. Uh, during the Great Depression, they were selling like hotcakes, and in 1967, two million boards flew off the shelves, beating even Monopoly. Don't know why Monopoly is popular to begin with. It's meant to show you why Monopolies are bad, and that's why it's boring and long. <laughs> but the story behind Monopoly's inception is crazy, though. Oh, is that is that a different episode? Is it? Is I it don't, a cult it, in any way? It's not a cult in any way, unfortunately. But maybe we should do a one-off. Just a little, just a little our own tarot tangent. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. I mean, this is just in general. This is reminding me that like during times of like depression or recession or just like economic disaster or world disasters we tend to turn like we always see like an uptick in different whatever the spiritualism of the time is so at this in this particular instance we've got some heavy reliance on ouija boards to basically like look for answers as a way to try and take back control in a very uncontrollable and chaotic time yeah for sure like um that's like a very trackable data point in economics. Like when there's world wars, anything esoteric or woo-woo kind of spikes in in money-making yeah. skills. I think we've talked a few times about um, World War II and how, uh, uh, what was it? Women became involved in the police force in Australia was because like during World War II, all the, all the women like wanted to see tarot readers to like predict the future of the men going yes. off to war. Mm-hmm. And uh, so to combat that, they started to, like, put women in the police force to go undercover and, like, find the, and find, pe- find, find people, people that were taking advantage. Yeah. They, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a little bit wild. Another interesting point when I was doing some marketing for a zombie thing a long time ago is that apparently zombies in modern age are another thing that peak around times of, like, world crisis. Really? That's like, interesting. Zombie- Zombie shows, zombie games, zombie movies, like that seems to be like a, it's like that apocalyptic mindset where it's like, cool, let's put, we're all in this chaotic space together. We don't know what's going to happen. And it's almost like we trend towards things that like show us how to survive in a sense. Oh, sure. Whereas like this is the, like a little bit about like, how do I gain control by talking to spirits or ancestors or my guides or just predicting the future in general? That's crazy. I would have never thought zombies, but that makes sense. Okay. Maybe you should put out like a zombie PSA. Zombie PSAs. If you're struggling right now, then... Then watch some zombie movies? <laughs> then don't watch zombie movies? I don't guess watch, I'm not sure watch. what the messaging yeah, no. is. It didn't help me. I feel like all the zombie <laughs> content that came out around like pandemic times was not... I was like, this is the last thing I need right now. Yeah, for sure. Um. So then 1973 happened. The Exorcist hit theaters... And suddenly Ouija was the devil's play thing. Uh, It went from jokey and hokey to horror show materials. uh Religious groups denounced it. Even paranormal enthusiasts were getting a bit spooked. But guess what? Ouija made a comeback because of this. Economic uncertainty and its spooky aura made made it a hit again. It's in movies, TV shows, even on bras and undies at like Hot Topic. (laughs) Oh my God. Oh yeah, I've seen those. Mm Mm-hmm. There's even an app for, like, on-the-go seance enthusiasts. Oh, just, you know, I guess. Okay, cool. There's a digital version of it now, I guess. Yeah. Just the potential of a demon infesting my technology is not something I want to mess with. I feel like it's already there. I think, yeah. I think it's already in there. I don't think it, like, needs to be welcomed in. <laughs> I, I know, think it's right? like, if you go to the right website, you're going to find some demons. Exactly. That's for sure. 
So let's talk about the burning question. How the heck does the Ouija board work? Spoiler alert, it's not spirits or demons. It's just us. Scientists call it the ideometer effect. It's all about non-conscious movements. Uh Uh-huh. So the ideometer effect is basically this quirky thing our brains do. It's when our thoughts or mental images sneakily influence our muscles to move without us even realizing it. Imagine your brain playing puppet master with your body, but you're totally unaware of the strings being pulled. Which is kind of terrifying. It's weird. Um, I remember, I do remember learning, I didn't know it was called this, and my brother didn't know it was called this either, but he's he was five years older than me. So like when I first learned about pendulums, and oh, I fine. can't even remember, it was probably from some silly show or tv show or something about like you know like if it goes like up and down it, the answer is yes or left to right it's no basically it was like and i was like yeah look because it's like basically like you can tie a penny to a string and get answers and he was like no okay okay no now tie that string to like this non-moving lamp and don't touch the lamp either because that's the thing like these muscle movements are so small that it will not look like the other person's moving you won't even think you're moving so it's like, and you can't touch the lamp either because if you like, like your muscle movements will affect like the lamp even. And so it's like, I did it and it's like, oh, <laughs> oh, the pendulum's, pendulum's not moving. He's like, okay, now like, you know, hold it again. But like, just like think about like what direction you want it to go. And it was kind of like, oh, I could like yeah, move it in a circle or like make it go crazy ways. But it like did not look like I was moving in any way, shape or form. So it's one of those things where it's like, I, I this got debunked for me very early. I was elementary school very early. Oh, that's a good <laughs> yeah. big brother move. Yeah, he was like, ooh, maybe, maybe don't use that as a way to make decisions in life. <laughs> <laughs> like, thanks, big brother. <laughs> that's so funny. You could have either found that out by him explaining it or by making the decision based off that and having it go horribly wrong. Horrible, exactly. It's like, I just talked to my pendulum and I'm like, oh, <laughs> that can go real bad. Yeah. So back in the day, uh, this phenomenon got some attention in the world of paranormal stuff, like exactly what you're talking, you know, pendulums and that sort of thing. People noticed that when folks used these kind of tools, there were these, like you said, tiny involuntary movements happening, like the planchette on a Ouija board would start to glide around seemingly on its own. Turns out it is actually just our subconscious beliefs or expectations pulling the strings, not some like supernatural force. Yeah. And science psychologists have actually dived into the ideomotor effect or ideometer effect, explaining it as a form of motor suggestion. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. And essentially your thoughts or expectations can sneakily guide your movements, even if you're not clued in on it. It's not just like Ouija boards. You can spot this effect in things like dousing, where like somebody uses a rod and, or a pendulum to find water underground, that sort of thing. Uh-huh. These movements might seem mysterious, but it's really just your brain doing its thing behind the scenes. So when your friends are like convinced the Ouija board is possessed because the planchette is spelling out messages, you can casually drop like the ideometer knowledge. It seems like our brains have like a secret dance with our muscles, and sometimes it makes things seem way spookier than they actually are. I want to know if anybody has been in a situation for a Ouija board where like everybody wanted a different answer. So like the Ouija board didn't spell anything outright or they were like basically at like a stalemate like imagine if you're like in a group of like four people and everyone wants like a different answer for the same question and it's just <laughs> yeah. like everyone's idiomotor is just like no I'm like it's not moving and you're like because none of us want the same thing so we can't like find it <laughs> yeah if you uh are listening and you've used a ouija board then write in tangents at mysticfoolterror.com tell us your stories I will say there, there. I have met some people who had creepy experiences with Ouija boards, not because they used them, but because they had to get rid of the Ouija board to get rid of a very strange experience that was happening in their house. Interesting. You know, it's not my story. And there's a part of me that's like, I wish it was. I wish that I had these, like, I'm the weird chaser. I'm like, yeah, give me your weird experiences. I think that'd be so dope. This person does not like having these experiences at all. She's just like, I don't want them. I don't want them. I don't seek them out. And it's just kind of like there was a Ouija board that she had to get rid of because it like constantly there was like it smelled like cigar smoke. Creepy things were happening in her room. She would like see a ghost like at the end of her bed every now and then. And it wasn't until that like she found the Ouija board because she didn't know that it was even in her room. It was just like under her bed. 
and had gotten stored there. And it was like, once it was gone, she's like, I never, none of that stuff ever happened. Yeah. I mean, like, if we're talking about what we think is actually going on, obviously, I think that most of it is this ideometer effect, you know, 99% the, yeah, so of the, the actual, time. like, moving of the, yeah. But also, like... We've put so much thought behind these sort of things. And if you're actually scared or terrified in the situation, you know, you could definitely make some things happen. You know, that's kind of where, you know, the point of this podcast is like, let's find out the truth, the situation here. And like, <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be doing a Ouija board, you know, in my <laughs> house. That's for sure. Because I think that it, to some extent, some of this sort of crazy stuff could happen. It's spooky. I was going to say, like, there's that line of like, I know things intellectually but I still feel things that are different than what my brain knows. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. And I just don't want to kill that mystery of life, you know? Then, It'd be fun yeah. if Ouija boards were haunted. Yeah, keep a little magic. Well, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. <laughs> <laughs> what a segue into the end. <laughs> I want to hear about your Ouija board experiences. Please let us know. I want to hear more. I know. I'd, I'd be cool. I'd love to, like, read people's stories, and we can keep it anonymous. You, you, yeah, we can you keep know. it anonymous. I just want to know. just mm -hmm. want to hear other people's stories. Yeah, for sure, because I don't have any I don't have any experiences with this. I want to I wanna know before I dip my toes. Is that season three, Ruth? Is that, like, we go out and we try weird things? Yeah, maybe it's just, like, we let the Ouija board dictate what we talk about <laughs> on the podcast. That could be an episode for sure. We could try. We'll see where our idiometer takes us. Yes, let's see where it goes. That would be interesting. We can have a uh, we can have one of our partners like write down the letters to keep track of what's being spelled. I think that's a great idea. So if you're a fan of the podcast, we uh, need you to tell your friends so we can find new fans, or tell your Ouija board to subscribe. Yeah, ask your yeah, ask your Ouija board. Who who else? Who should we talk about? Actually, that'd be great if you're a medium. Yeah. Who uses Ouija boards. What would actually be interesting to talk about? Yes. What's a topic we should explore? Mm -hmm. Give us we're ideas. We're clearly to like, we're, we're not in the same place, so we can't like use the Ouija board together. And we're not allowed to use it alone. So we need you. We need you, the viewer, to help us. And we need you to follow us on all socials. Our handles are Sweet Dead Inc. and Mystic Voltero on all platforms. See you later. See you later. <laughs>